Advent. A time of waiting, preparation, and joyful expectation for Jesus' birth. But Advent is not just about the past. It's also about the future. The second coming of our Savior. The day when hope, love, joy, and peace will culminate into Christ's glorious return. Until then, we wait. Morning, church. So good to be with you all. Uh, I don't know if you noticed, but uh, the lobby is open. Bathrooms are also open. No more Phoenix Open type bathrooms. So guys, thank you so much for your patience. Uh, You know, everything is, you know how you have a DIY project and like that last 1% takes you like three months to finish, you know, right? We're there, we're approaching the finish line. Flooring should come hopefully sooner than later. You see some blue tape, there's some punch list thing. Also, children's space, we plan to have that open next Sunday as well. So be looking for that. You can follow us on uh, social media for the updates. We'll, uh, we'll drop some for you throughout the week. But once again, guys, thank you so much for your patience and, and your support through this process. It's been amazing and just appreciate you guys very, very much. Um, yeah, flooring, flooring is not here, probably won't be here for next week. So if you are going to spill your drink, please do it today. You know what I'm saying? Do it today. It's like when you have new furniture and you tell the kids, no, that's not for you. Don't sit on it. Don't use it, you know? Guys, for Christmas this space will be buttoned up. And the primary goal is for this campus to be the kind of facility that is just super warm, super welcoming and inviting so that you can help us host Christmas Eve services. You understand the languaging I'm using? We're gonna put this thing on together. You know what I'm saying? We're gonna host this together. So now be thinking and praying about those who will join you. Christmas is just one of those. Christmas is a massive secular holiday. That's kind of what it's turned into. But people are open to your personal invite. So more details on that to come. But this is the first Sunday of Advent. And so we're gonna step out of our series in Romans and we're gonna take the next four weeks and focus on the birth of Jesus. Advent, if this is new to you, this is something Christians have been doing for several hundred years. The word Advent literally means arrival. And so what they've been doing is preparing their hearts and their minds in anticipation of the birth of Jesus and what that means. And so our Advent theme today is hope. Our hope is not placed in a circumstance or an event, but for the Christian, their hope is actually placed in a person, and that is the person of Jesus. And so when I use the word hope, we probably need to bring some clarification to that because when we speak of hope, it's it's kind of like, we might say something like this. Well, I hope next summer won't be as hot as it was last summer. So there's an element of pessimism in that. That's not the concept of biblical hope. Biblical hope is this, it's this confident assurance that what God says and what he promises will come to pass. No thing, no person, nothing will thwart God's plan. That is the source of Christian hope. And so in Romans chapter 15, as Paul is describing the attributes of God, he actually says this, Romans chapter 15 and verse 13. He says, may the God of hope, in other words, what he's he's doing is he's rooting this concept of hope in the very nature of God himself. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing Believing what? Well, number one, you have to believe that God exists. Number two, you have to believe that is to trust in what Jesus did for you. It's what Christians refer to as the atoning work of Jesus, dying on the cross for your sins. May the God of all of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Paul has been talking a lot about the Holy Spirit in the book of Romans, the most misunderstood person of the Trinity, and the word that he often associates with the Holy Spirit is right there. It's the word power. So in other words, what he's saying is the Holy Spirit quickens your mind and your heart to the things of God, specifically what you believe about God to be true. 
so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Here's what he's saying. God is not only the source, but he is also the supplier of that confident assurance that you can't live without. People need hope. Currently, there are two major wars with little end in sight. There's massive bloodshed. The number of those who are experiencing anxiety, depression, mental illness, thoughts of suicide have skyrocketed over the last three years. If you were to ask anybody, would you define the world as a hopeful place? The answer, I think, would predominantly be no. It's rather hopeless. And so what's crazy about the Christian message is the events that happened 2,000 years ago in the birth of this baby actually supplies the very thing that the world needs most today. And by the way, this isn't just, this isn't a, a, a modern need or occurrence. The ancient people of God had this forward-looking mentality. And as bad as things got for them, as their world crumbled around. You know how difficult it would be to be a Christian living in Rome in the first century? It'd be very difficult for you. And so where do you find hope then? Where literally, if you lived under Nero, it's your life as a Christian. And so the ancient people of God had this well, this deep well that they would draw from. And it began with an understanding of what their Bibles actually said, because you see, 700 years before they existed, This prophet comes on the scene, his name is Isaiah, and he says this, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Now whenever God gives people a sign, it's going to be supernatural. Here it is. Behold, the virgin shall conceive. Now that's a good one. God is really good at giving you a sign. Okay, it's gonna be unmistakable. Virgin shall conceive and bear a son. And then we get this little detail, and he will be called Emmanuel. Emmanuel, which means what? God with us. Now, spoken in its context, this would be something super radical because back in the day, most everybody outside of the Jews had a polytheistic belief, and the Greeks and the Romans especially believed that the gods kind of, (laughs) they lived these nefarious lives out in the spirit world. And they mingled and mixed it up with each other. They were constantly at war with each other. They were fighting. They were taking advantage of each other. The Greek and Roman gods, they were, they, were, um, they were not to be trusted. And every once in a while, when they got bored, they would mingle with the affairs of humans, but only for a time. And so this Christian concept of God being with humanity is something absolutely revolutionary. And this is why in John, when he writes his biography of the life of Jesus, John had a front row seat to the life of Jesus. He was one who was very close, perhaps the closest of Jesus' friends. He writes a biography about his life. And this is how he starts it. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Well, who is the Word? Well, drop down to verse 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And everybody, the Greeks and Romans were like, said what? God with man? Well, yeah, it was foretold 700 years earlier by the prophet in the name Emmanuel. God would take on human flesh and dwell with us, but he would arrive in the most unusual way. Oh, and by the way, this is your sign. A virgin gives birth. Virgin gives birth. This is why when the angels make this announcement to the shepherds, what are they gonna be looking for? They're looking for a virgin birth. It also plays into this sense of what people were hoping for that you see all surrounding Jesus in in his own time. Uh, We'll get there in a a second. More details about this child. By the way, every every good, God-fearing, young Jewish girl, she would begin to think, well, I understand what my Bible says about this forthcoming Messiah being born of a virgin, but it's been a very popular messianic principle. Could it be me? She thought. Could it be me? And then Mary and Joseph come on the scene. And there's a specific circumstance that they have with an individual named Simeon that sets the stage for who Jesus is. When the Bible wants to communicate how profound this birth is, 
It does so through this very unique relationship, and we'll get to that in a second. More from this prophet, Isaiah chapter nine. For to us, a child is born. It's one thing for a child to be born, but it's another thing for a son to be given. Most popular verse in the Bible, John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he what? He gave, he's a giver. Well, that's right in line with what the prophet said. To us, a son is given, and the government shall be on his shoulder. The word government here means power and authority. And his name shall be called, now, now, okay, check out the name of this, of, of this uh, child. Wonderful counselor, check. Everybody needs some counseling today. Mighty God, everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government, that is his power and his authority, and the increase of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David, he will come from the line of David. That's why some of the biblical authors, they're careful to trace the genealogy of Jesus as they set the stage for an explanation of who he is because if Jesus is gonna be the fulfillment of the words of the prophet, then you need to know he was from the line of David just like the prophet said. That's why they're very careful in tracing his lineage because what they're saying is, we're not making this stuff up, the stuff that God promised beforehand, it's come true. Jesus is the fulfillment of all those Old Testament words, prophecies. Uh, David and over his kingdom to establish it and, and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness. He's gonna be the perfect judge. What's done in darkness, he sees if, as if it's done in light. He brings the perfect amount of justice with regard to any offense. He does it perfectly every time. No human judge can come close to that. With righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. So the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do. This is something that God is passionate. Wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. So there's some very lofty titles and these are the things that gave the ancient people of God hope. So here's part of the story. The Bible tells us about this man named Simeon and he's old. So you have to picture this guy with gray hair, his body is failing, his eyesight is weak. And we're told that he's a devout man, which means he really cared about what God said, and he lived his life accordingly. And so he gets this revelation from God, before you die, you are going to see the Lord's anointed one. You are going to see the Messiah. So if you're this guy, where would you be in anticipation of God fulfilling these words to you? Well, you would be on the temple grounds because every good, God-fearing, young Jewish couple who had a firstborn son would be making their pilgrimage, walking up. Anybody been to the temple, the steps of the temple in Jerusalem? The, you know, they're, they're constructed in a very thoughtful way. They're not even. You know why they're not even, like normal steps? They're, they're sort of out of place and disjointed. You know why? Because you approach the sacred space of God slowly. You can't run up those steps. It's very difficult. You kind of have to thoughtfully plan where you're going to plant your foot, and you approach it in reverence. So Simeon is there, and he's waiting, and he's watching. Now, the sight of many young couples carrying baby boys would be very familiar. Is it this one? No. Is it this one? No. And so here's the story, Luke chapter two. And when the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, so there was a certain time set aside, particularly for a woman's purification after she had given birth, roughly 42 days after the birth of Jesus, they bring him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. Why? Well, because they wanna honor the scriptures. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. That's from Exodus chapter 13. And... Additionally, as you offer the child up in, in service to God, there, there is a sacrifice to be made. And the sacrifice is according to what is said in the law of the Lord, which is a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. So this is how we know that Jesus grew up in some relative poverty. Um, by the way, uh, the nativity set that you have where it shows baby Jesus in a manger and everybody visiting him, probably wrong. He's probably about a toddler at that stage. And the reason, well, well here's one proof of that, one evidence for, for that. Remember that there are gifts that are brought to Mary and Joseph by the, by, by the wise men. And gold, 
they would have been wealthy instantly with these gifts. And so what's interesting about this little detail in the text is that uh, Jesus being very, very little, just a few days old, according to the law, you had to offer a sacrifice along with presenting your, your child, dedicating him to God. Typical sacrifice would be a lamb. Those were a bit expensive. There was an allowance in the law for the poor. And that allowance was two turtle doves or two pigeons. Now you could buy a pigeon or a turtle dove for about a penny. So this is, this is about two cents worth, okay? Why? Because that's all they could afford. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, and he was waiting. Here's another title applied to Jesus for the consolation of Israel. When someone consoles you, what are they doing? It's like they're bringing salve to your soul. By the way, the nation of Israel is still waiting and in need of this consolation. And until they recognize Jesus as the fulfillment of hundreds of years of worth, their own, their own Old Testament prophets, he's the fulfillment of that, they will never experience true consoling. And the Holy Spirit was upon him, and it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Christ means Messiah. And he came in the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, Simeon takes him up in his arms. And then he blesses God, and he says this, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace. According to your word, you kept your promise, for my eyes have seen your salvation. That's how he characterizes this baby, salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples. Now it's getting very interesting because for the Jew, the Messiah was strictly a Jewish thing. And here, you have one of the first instances of somebody saying, no, 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 no. Jesus isn't just for the nation of Israel. Jesus is for all people. A light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. For Israel and for non-Israel. For the Jew and for the non-Jew. So you have to picture this scene. Um, this old guy, you know, he's about to die. And you know, a goofy thing happens to you as you put on the years you become a lot more self-aware that time is short. And you begin to think about what's next. You also begin to contemplate where you have placed your hope in life. Because where you place your hope will directly influence the way you live here and now. All of his hope has been dropped on Jesus. And literally, he says, I'm good. I can die at peace because, God, I know without a doubt that you keep your word. I have seen your salvation for all people. And I have to tell you that, I don't, you know, I've read this passage many times, but man, it hit me in a new way this week and it brought a special measure of conviction into my life because I've had to ask myself the question, could that be said of me? Is Jesus the ultimate source of my hope? If so, I think it could be said, I'm good. <laughs> because so often hope resides in a circumstance, whether you want it to come into your life or you want it removed from your life. God, I'll be at peace when, if only, you know, as I age, as long as it looks like this, man, you know, life never goes the way you think it will. And if you drop your ultimate sense of hope on your spouse or your kids or your closest friends, you're wrecked. How do you know, simple question, how much anxiety do you have in your life? What is the source of your anxiety? could be a good determinant of where your ultimate hope lies. So Jesus grows older, becomes a man, and all these people surround him because they see something in him that they want. 
They want to be near him, John chapter one. The next day, that is the day after Jesus was baptized, again, John, that's John the Baptist, he was standing with two of his disciples, and then he looked at Jesus as Jesus was walking by, and he says, behold the Lamb of God. And everybody's horrified because they understand the language. Lambs of God were sacrificed. Now everybody's like, oh, that's such a sweet title. That's so precious. No, everybody's like, wait, what? In other words, what John is saying is, this guy's gonna die. He's gonna pay your sin debt. This is the lamb that has been submitted by God himself. The two disciples that were with John, see, John the Baptist had his own disciples. Uh, they heard him say this, and they're like, bye, John. And John's like, I'm cool with that. You know, I must decrease. He's the one that must increase. I'm not even fit to untie that guy's sandals. He has the right perspective. That's humility. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, what are you seeking? And they said to him, rabbi, which means teacher, title of respect. Where are you staying? I love this because they don't say to Jesus, show us something supernatural. Prove to us you are the son of God. Do something spectacular. We've heard the stories. They don't say that. They don't ask for a miracle. They ask for his address. We wanna hang out with you. We wanna spend time with you. We wanna be near you. And Jesus never turns down that, uh, that ask. He said to them, come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying and they stayed with him that day for it was about the 10th hour later in the day. Everywhere Jesus went, people saw him as this object of hope. Now, there's this one story in the life of Jesus that is particularly enlightening and it has to do with a woman who recognized who Jesus is when everybody else in the room failed and she got shamed for it. Mark chapter 14, and while he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, pause, so right back in the day, you have the social ladder, you have the Pharisees, you have the religious leaders at the top of the hierarchy, but at the very bottom, you have the untouchables. You have the lepers who were considered unclean. So this is a very rough exist existence. Uh, you, you, if you were about to approach the city, you had to declare yourself your presence. Unclean, unclean, unclean. How's that for your self-image? People scatter, let you through, you can do your business. And if you got too close without announcing your presence, it was perfectly legal for people to pick up rocks and chuck them at you. So just this offhand comment, you know, he, he's, he just sets the stage with this story, Mark says like, oh, well, let me tell you about this time that Jesus was having dinner with Simon. Well, Bethany wasn't a very big town, probably more than one Simon. Which Simon are you talking about? I'm talking about Simon the leper. Elsewhere, Jesus heals a leper. He could have stood at a distance and said, be healed. But instead, the text includes a very important detail. Jesus touches him. And that's the one thing lepers did not have was human touch, human contact. You know, see, you understand? This is why you wanna drop everything you have on Jesus because there's nobody like him. Once you recognize who he is, and that's exactly where this story goes, check this out. As he was reclining at table, a woman came with an alabaster flask. Alabaster is a, is a soft uh, stone that can be carved in, into beautiful, beautiful objects, made, made to look very pretty. Inside this alabaster flask is this ointment of pure nard, okay? It was very, very expensive. The alabaster itself, very expensive, but the contents of pure nard even more so. And the reason why is because this came from a flower, the spike nard, that didn't grow anywhere near Jerusalem or Bethany. You had to go a long ways to get a lot of this flour and turn it into pure nard. Very, very expensive. In fact, as we'll learn, just this one bottle of pure nard is worth an entire year's wage, okay? And she broke the flask, which was unnecessary, by the way. Okay, but this, tell, this, this describes, I think, her exuberance in being in the presence of Jesus and, and her recognition of who he is. She broke the flask and poured it over his head. Now, there were some who said to themselves indignantly, now, they don't say it out loud, but they have the thought, why is she doing this? What a waste! 
This could have, this is like virtue signaling. This could have been used to serve the poor. Yeah, but what are you doing? You gonna criticize somebody else in their act of, of sacrifice when you don't do anything? And it's, the, the, why was the ointment wasted like that? It could have been sold for more than 300 denarii, given to the poor, they scolded her. And Jesus says, stop, you leave her alone. Why are you hassling her? She's done a beautiful thing to me. You know, the poor, they're always gonna be around. You will always have the opportunity to serve the poor, and that's important. Jesus isn't minimizing that, but he is maximizing something else that they've missed, and that is opportunity. Jesus says, I won't always be with you. The poor, they will always be with you. You'll always have an opportunity to serve them in the flesh, but I'm here with you now, only for a time. No, what she's done is beautiful, and here's the deal. She recognizes something you don't. She's placed value on me in ways that you haven't. Now notice this. She's done a beautiful thing to me for you always have the poor with you and, and whenever you want you can do good for them but you will not always have me. She has done what she could. Man, may that be said of me. She has anointed my body beforehand for burial. Now that's an important one because what she's doing is this. I, I, this isn't just like, oh, this great rabbi, this great teacher has come here. I've been invited to this dinner party. No, she's like, I know who you are. And I know what you've done for me. This was an ointment used to essentially cover the stench of death. And she dumps a year's worth of it on Jesus. Why? Because she's saying, I know what you're about to do for me. You're about to give your life so that I can have eternal life. And that's the source of her hope. Truly, I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in all the world, including Scottsdale, Arizona, right now, what she has done will be told in memory of her. Jesus was right about that. 2,000 years later, we're talking about it. The disciples say, what a waste. And Jesus says, it's a beautiful thing. She did what she could. Christian hope is in a person. The reason why you and I struggle with anxiety is because we have misplaced hope. I've said it before. Your greatest problem has been solved. Your greatest problem is that you were born a sinner separated from a holy and righteous God. That's a big problem for you. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. That's eternal separation. But the free gift of God in Jesus Christ is eternal life. That's what he came to bring. That's what she recognizes. She takes all of her hope and just pours it on Jesus. Here's a helpful example that's been used before. Christian hope affects the way you live here and now. So you have two people. You put them in two separate rooms, but both rooms are exactly the same. Inside the room, exact same setup, nothing different about the two. You tell the people, here's, what you're doing, here's your job. Take part A, attach it to part B. You'll do this five days a week, eight hours a day. You get an hour lunch break, okay? You have the same tools in both rooms to do this job. So you go to the first person, you say, here's, here's, here's what's gonna happen. You do this for a year. At the end of the year, you're gonna be paid $1,000. You go to the second person and you tell them, you do this for a year and you will be paid $1 billion. At the end of the first week, you ask the first person, all right, how's it going? And they're gonna be like, I'm getting, I'm getting paid a thousand bucks to do this, a thousand bucks for an entire year. This is such a waste. This is such a waste of my time. You go to the second person. You say, hey, you're a week into this. How you doing? You're a week closer to being a billionaire. How do you feel about it? And they're gonna say, this is the easiest thing ever. Thank you. They're gonna say, thank you for giving me this opportunity. You see the difference? The difference is in the outlook of the future Christian. You follow? Do you really understand your futuristic outlook? What Jesus has rescued you from, your biggest problem has been solved. That's why you drop everything on Jesus and other people will look at you and go, what a waste. So look, at it. if there are people in your life that don't, they watch you spend your time, your money, your talents, your child, all those things that God has given you, and if they don't look at you and say, why would you waste those things? 
Why would you waste those things on your God? Because your hope does not lie in temporary things. I had an incident happen to me a couple weeks ago. I think I alluded to it, to it at least one of the services. Man, and there's this, there's this incident that happened. And, you know, one of my pet peeves is rudeness. At the core of rudeness is probably my own pride, all right? Like, I should be treated a certain way. And, and if you don't treat me that way, then I'm going to be upset with you, okay? So that happened. And it had something to do with, an, with actually with an object, a material possession. And man, I was struggling with it. And God, through his spirit and these texts, helped me realize, you know, one day all of this stuff is gonna pass. It's gonna be gone. It's so temporary. And so why would you put your hope in temporary things? Unlike your 401k, what you have awaiting for you in heaven will never be depleted. It will never be stolen. It will never decrease. So the location of your hope affects the way you live here and now. I love what Jonathan Edwards says. He said, Christian hope involves three things. Number one, our good things can never be taken away from us. Romans 5 tells us that nothing, nothing will separate us from God's love in Christ Jesus. In Ephesians, he says, you have this glorious inheritance awaiting you. Nothing, no, our good things can never be taken away from us. Secondly, he says, even our bad things turn out for good. I mean, how hopeful is that? This is the heartbeat of the Christian message because our leader gets nailed to a cross and that's a really bad day. Even Jesus' earliest followers, they, they're huddled together in this room and they're kind of like, mm, what's next, boys, what's next? Jesus takes the greatest suffering and turns it into great hope. Even our bad things turn out for good. Thirdly, he says, the best things are yet to come. So I think, you know, when Christians run around and they're so freaked out by what's happening in this world, you have to stop and realize, what message does that send to those who don't yet know Jesus about the sovereignty of God, the God in which we say we believe and we hope in? To be a Christian in the first century would have been extraordinarily difficult, living under Nero. And yet, this is the foundation of our faith. This is where these writers, this is the backdrop. And they write with such hope and encouragement. And it does shape the way we live here and now, where you place your hope. Just one last example. Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr., is considered by many even today as one of the greatest lawyers of all time. He was a Supreme Court judge for, I think, roughly about 30 years. He was a devout atheist and an outspoken believer in Darwinian evolution. Very interesting individual. He actually believed that those in authority had the right to decide who lives and who doesn't live based on their desirability and their contribution. So he was an advocate for the sterilization of women who were considered less qualified. And in fact, in many ways, he was a racist. His hope was in humanity, not realizing that this hopefulness would lead to the death of many. Very important where you place your hope. In fact, he went on to, to write this. I see no reason for attributing to, a man, to man a significant difference in kind from that which belongs to a baboon or a grain of sand. Wow. That's a very small view of human life. But when your hope is in humanity, uh, everything is up for grabs. Which human are you hoping in and according to what they say? what they believe, that's sketchy. Compare that to someone like another junior, Martin Luther King Jr., whose speech toward the end of his life, he famously said, I have a dream. And then you know what that dream includes? Quoting the Bible. A lot of people think that these words were original to himself. He's actually quoting the prophet Isaiah. 
I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted and every hill and mountain shall be made low. The rough places will be made plain and the crooked places will be made straight and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. Do you know what that's talking about? Jesus, talking about the Messiah. It means very much what you place your hope in. So I'm gonna have you bow your heads and close your eyes. Advent is about anticipation. And so there's, there's a lot to be worked out. If the source of your hope is anything other than the promise of God fulfilled in the person of Jesus, your life's gonna be rather shaky. And to know that the best is yet to come, to know that whatever happens to you on this planet sets you up for greater success in the life to come, God even uses hardship to bring about what is in your best interest. And so it's little wonder that Jesus said, remember my death, burial, remember my resurrection. That was some of his last, a dying man's words are among his last important. What he leaves his disciples with is, of all the things he taught, remember this. Remember my death. That is the foundation for it all. That is the source of your hope. So as we enter into this time of communion, I, you know, I, I would just say that this is something that Christians do as a response to what Jesus has said. And if you're not yet a believer in Jesus, you can let this pass by you. But I, I would ask you this, where is your hope? Yeah, you know, where do you place it? And a good, good determiner of that is what is it in your life that's causing you to become undone? And what would it be like for you to trust God for that? So Father, would you, by the power of your spirit, speak to us now, just in the stillness of this, this moment, these next few moments, Lord, speaking to us in a profound way. And I guess, God, what we need to begin with is just a heartfelt gratitude that you give us hope in something that is absolutely unshakable. Without the resurrection of Jesus, all would be lost. But we recognize hopelessness went out with the resurrection. Guide us in this time, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.